Photoshop saved our bacon <laughs> or whatever. Um, we lost the space where we were meant to be and they stepped forward and gave us their theater and this is their beautiful theater. And we're incredibly grateful. Um, for those of you who don't know the Foundry Theater, we don't have a theater. We are a theater company. We are people who make things. And um, so having a home even for a couple of hours means a lot to us. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, about 21 years ago, uh, when the Foundry was first started, uh, we had done one show, and um, it was the time in which um, the, the, the massacre in Srebrenica was occurring, and nobody knew what to do, um, or at least that's what it felt like for a while. And I thought, well, what should we do? <laughs> How do we think about this? And so we had a big gathering at my friend Coco McPherson's house, and it happened to be that that was the first Foundry Dialogue, and that was about 21 years ago, almost to the day of this time. Um, and so for many years, the dialogues were about, I think, unpacking, you know, they were like these giant pause buttons going, okay, wait a minute, this is happening. Do we know this is happening? Is this what we mean to be happening? And so a lot of those first dialogues in the first years of the company were about really trying to understand what the issue was. And I'm happy to say that um, in the second decade, after I went to the World Social Forum and saw really how much was going on and that I had no idea in terms of proposals for how else to think about these issues beyond there being catastrophes. I was so inspired, I practically cartwheeled home from Brazil. And, um, and our dialogues began to change in such a way as we began to invite people who were actually working prefiguratively as opposed to strictly in protest. Not that we shouldn't be protesting the structures that exist, but there are so many people who are actually living the future with the living of their lives. And so that has become a big part of our dialogues for the second 10 years of Family Dialogues. So um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to keep talking till people come out, but um, <laughs> I also wanted to, so I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to invite you to this and for your coming. And I now would like to introduce the curator of these dialogues, who herself is a prefigurative creature on this planet. And her name is Nana Sen. And I pass it. Cultural Arts Direct Action Group based in New York City. 
and Betty's Daughters offers a slate of services designed to instigate, inspire, and incite progressive change for individuals and artists. Um, Aurora Lemons Morales, um, who some of you, you know, might have, have heard of her already, uh, she was born in Puerto Rico uh, to Puerto Rican and Ashkenazi Jewish, Jewish parents. As a woman with chronic illness and disability, she has learned to invent creative ways to engage with the world through writing, visual art, conversation, mentoring, ritual, and more. A lifelong activist and radical artist, or left, lifelong feminist and radical artist and activist uh, and historian, her writing bridges the gaps between the intimately personal and the global, between a passionate witnessing of our traumas and a profound belief in the possibilities of a just and joyous world. Aurora is also the author of Medicine Stories, Remedios, and most recently, uh, her book, Kindling Writings on the Body, which was published by Palabra Press. We are so excited to have them here in conversation with each other. It's just, it's the highlight of, of our whole lives, it feels like, so. Yeah. I'm gonna just start clapping and hope that they'll <laughs> Uh, has taken me on a, a, a kind of a 
winding road considering what um, police brutality and what environmental justice have to do with each other, what does reproductive justice have to do with climate justice. So it's just like a, 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 you know, a remixing of, of uh, how, I come into the, how I came into the world, just like being a little girl laying on her back looking at the clouds. It's changed, but it's still just as important, I think. And, and for me, as somebody who identifies as, an, as a Latin American, the questions in this country, there's been more of a tendency for environmental activism to be separated from other kinds of activism, to not really be fused together. In Latin America, that's not as much the case. Mm -hmm. um, people are very clear that, that the assaults on the environment are deeply connected to international relations and, and racism and gender issues, so that you have um, indigenous-led women's organizations mm -hmm. tackling these things together and talking about the planting of trees and about reproductive rights and about food. Um, I, there was a sign recently in a demonst women's demonstration, I think in Paraguay, that said um, feminist land reform is the answer to world hunger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that, and land reform takes into account the deforestation of the land. It takes into account foreign companies doing mining that's destructive and poisoning the water. And often women in agricultural communities and in rural communities are the first ones to notice the signs of environmental degradation. Mm -hmm. They work with the land in, in an intimate way where often men are traveling for work and women are producing food right here in both some Toronto farms. Mm -hmm. So it's more integrated, I think, in other places than here. But we're going to take that. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Ace of Spades. <laughs> oh, it's the same question. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, this is for both of us. Tell us more about your creative work. What art do you make? What inspires you creatively? And what disrupts your artistic practice? I'm going to read some. Fire, water. You were born a fire sign, red like your father and mouthy like me. At your naming ceremony, the priest wanted to call you Shango Olukun. I just sucked my teeth and fastened my seatbelt for an 18 year ride. Fire, water. Omnipresent and flattening. I knew you would break ice because your eyes only spoke the truth. In your seventh month, you dreamed new worlds with me. There was water and fire and fire and fire and water, alive like the elements pressing asphalt against shore. You said, pack everything up with the pirouette on my cervix. By the time the mid midwife was done removing her mask and gloves, we were in Barbados spooning fish stew over rice and peas. I knew you would ask me before you came, rushing down what concrete I broke in your name. So I have prepared a list. I hope it suits you. One. Never walk without joy perfuming your collarbones. Two, see the world your mothers could not see. Three, you are here because I loved myself. Four, tomorrow is brilliant because we are alive. Five, there are many parts to this story. I could never stop loving you. Six, I am your mother. You are not a project. There is light here. What I'm saying is, when we made you, we pressed oil out of banana leaves onto our thirsty backs. You came because the, far the farmer's market sells the sweetest onion and the biggest knots of ginger. When we made you, our spines were soft and supple and curved around the currants. We smiled, our tongues, our toes lunging closer to home. 
You are not a survival tactic. You are here because we loved you. You are not a mistake. You are not a miscalculation. You are not an incident. You are not an accident. You are not a statistic. You are not a rap sheet. You are not a rap sheet. You are not a prison sentence. You are here because the three of us made a choice. Mm. <laughs> so that is why um, I do my creative work. That is a little bit of the creative work that I do, taking an opportunity to provide a deeper um, lens into the intimate worlds we inhabit. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the things that come up in that poem uh, are the things that disrupt my artistic practice. So um, creativity and having a creative practice in some ways is a response, but those of us that were in that great workshop on Friday night uh, tried to move beyond being reactionary as creatives, whether we make art or not, you know? Um, and that is, I think, uh, mandatory for me at this time is to use all of the things that I have, tools at my disposal, to create the world that my mothers could not see. And um, so that's where I am right now. What about you? Well, <laughs> I come from long lines of storytellers mm -hmm. and long lines of radicals and a lot of artists. And really from an early age, I understood how stories construct the world, how what we're capable of imagining is what we're capable of creating, and that where our imaginations are constricted, we can't, we can't build. Until we tell ourselves the story of something, we can't embody it, we can't make it happen. And so for me, I began with poetry, I write a lot of prose poetry, I write personal essays, I'm beginning to do more visual art, and all of it is a summoning of possibility on one level or another. And really what, what disrupts my work is the same thing that provokes my work. Mm -hmm. Being alive in contested territory. Yeah. Um, pushing for the creation of societies that sustain all life. And sometimes the poetry takes me down paths that are about celebration and some of them are about fury and some of them are both. <laughs> And, you know, there's the lying in the grass and the beauty and the smell of the grass and needing to celebrate that connection to the living world. And there's the rage poems. I, I was, we were talking backstage earlier. Um, I had the opportunity to be paid to be a poet commentator on the news um, for Pacifica Radio right after 911. And every day I would read the headlines and go, where can poetry open something here that the headlines don't? And what poetry opened was a personal connection. <clears throat> so the, the headlines that said, you know, bomb falling on Baghdad, people could numb out to. But the poem that I wrote that particular day was about women were pregnant in Baghdad and inducing labor so they wouldn't have to go to the hospital while the bombs were falling. That's a personal, visceral body story about war that unnumbs people. And so all of what I do is to bring a bigger sense of possibility and to reinforce aliveness in the face of whatever comes at that. Um, um, and my, my art is both disrupted by disability and chronic illness and what I have learned over the course of my life as a working artist is that every barrier when you tell a story about it becomes something else. Mm -hmm. The story of what is broken is a thing that's whole. Mm -hmm. The story about why I can't write today is the story I needed to tell that day. You, yeah. I, I, so, yes, and um, there, 
there's something I think I would love to hear you talk about around um, the body being a, a space of creativity and being kind of at odds with because of all the environmental factors that we're talking about. Like the body being the site, the, the original site of creativity and the biggest hurdle to creativity. And that might be, uh, maybe I'm not phrasing it correct, no, I'm here. but having to negotiate all of those things. And in a world where disembodiment is so much the, you know, the status quo, to not be connected, to not want to be connected, actually to numb out. Absolutely, and um, I just finished um, putting out a book this last year called Kindling Writings on the Body, mm -hmm. which I wrote while I was lying flat in bed um, with a pinched disc in my back. Um, and, I, and I wrote about, there are days that I do not want to know about my body at all, mm -hmm. but the stories that are lodged in my body are sometimes so painful, um, and, and how the process of being able to get myself to listen to my body's stories, you know, it's, it's not simple. Um, mm -hmm. you know, what's the famous quote about writing is easy, just sit down and open a vein? <laughs> yes. I, I have, let me backtrack. I think that we come into the world attuned to our own flesh and attuned to what is around us mm -hmm. and systematically become alienated from those stories in us and stories in the world and the relationship between them. There are myriads of ways that we are taught to override the, the needs of our bodies in the service of somebody else's interests. Mm -hmm. We're trained from a very early age to prepare to be workers who subdue the need to move, the need to sing, the need to breathe deeply, the need to eat when we're hungry, not on someone else's schedule. That our bodies are the process of teaching us to be alienated from our bodies and to see our bodies as inert vehicles to take us places and raw materials to produce wealth <clears throat> deeply alienates us from, you know, we silence and silence and silence and it is a process to keep saying to the body, now I will listen to you. Mm -hmm. Now I will listen, I will listen again. When I'm writing, at this point after many years of practice, if I write something and there's something off about it, I haven't really gotten to the true thing I feel it in my body. Mm -hmm. there, there's a discomfort somewhere. And it has taken a tremendous amount of work to get myself to listen to that because all our training is to override it, to just push through. And parallel to that is our alienation from the natural world, which human beings evolved in and with and in relationship to and are part of. I, I really dislike the word environment as a description of nature because it seems like we're describing, it's, it's a stage for us. Mm -hmm. It's our environment. Mm -hmm. There is an eco-social web that we're part of mm -hmm. and all parts of it are aligned. But over a period of centuries, there has been, you know, particularly in European societies, a, a move toward seeing the natural world as really just raw materials to make stuff out of. Um, there's, you know, it extends to the level of absurdity where you have a corporation like Monsanto saying that bees steal pollen mm -hmm. that belongs to Monsanto and bees <laughs> appropriate sunshine that belongs to cash crops. You know, the extent of commodifying the natural world and their bodies and pretending they have no voices of their own. So one of the workshops I teach is writing from the body and I have people go inch by inch say, you know, the story of this knuckle. Like, what is, what is my arch and my left foot have to say to the world? We have huge archives of stories within our bodies mm -hmm. that have been suppressed. And so they don't just pop up easily. They require courtship. They require, it, it, it's like a wild animal that's been mistreated and needs to be slowly coaxed to come forth and, and speak. It's interesting that um, I asked you that question before I turned over the card number three, 
And that is exactly <laughs> what we were supposed to be talking about. Yeah, we are, we're, in, we're in sync. We're in sync. I will, I'll take psychic as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that, okay, so the question says, how does climate change and environmental trauma affect our bodies? That was the question. So Aurora answered that. In, <coughs> You know, it. yeah, you could definitely <laughs> um, continue, um, but I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tap in. Um, you know, I, I think that that this question is um, is one that I feel like I'm always negotiating, like daily, uh, or thinking about in some way. Um, and as Aurora is so eloquently talking about. Um, you know, the capitalist framework and how it is, it is at odds with nature, uh, or at odds with the rest of, you know, the, the ecosystems that we are a part of. Um, I, I, feel, I feel like what I feel in my body in this moment is the result of an accumulated archive. Um, in, in thinking about the archive as a, a living, breathing practice. Um, so there are things that I do that I, I pick up from, you know, my family and my mother and my mother's mother and my mother's mother. And being um, a part of, of, of people who are resilient, but also who have in some ways, um, in a lot of ways, had to bend around and kind of, you know, build up calluses to be able to, to breathe, literally, to be able to breathe. And so, uh, again, I, I mean, I think you spot on, I agree with you, um, um, in understanding environment as more as just like a, a transactional relationship that we can excavate and get what we need and there's no reciprocity. I feel like um, I, I definitely identify with that. And I feel like in having a different relationship or building a different practice in relationship to my internal and external environments um, is, is, is kind of a, the trajectory that I'm hoping to be on, uh, that I feel like I'm nudging in that direction. And what that means very concretely for me is recognizing that I am I am here as a part of a larger ecosystem, that I am a part of each star in the sky, that I am a part of everything that grows out of the ground, that I deserve to be here, and that um, um, that I can I can have an experience that is that is uh, uh, building a different relationship to trauma. Um, I feel in my body right now that my 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 uh, time as an activist, when I was when I identified in that way, um, was good time spent learning and being on the front lines. But right now, um, and we talked about again, we talked about this on Friday. Um, but right now, it really is about taking the space, reclaiming, snatching back the space to be visionary and to dream beyond trauma to dream beyond resistance. I am in a community of people who are on the front lines all over the country fighting and also being deeply impacted by that fight. And there is no, um, there is no a safety plan for people who put their bodies on the front line. So um, resistance is important, but vision is, is actually where I'm really situated right now. And I think um, um, dealing with and experiencing and exploring trauma and, and as it relates to in all of the environments that we are, I am a part of, has kind of pushed me. It's, that is the way I'm going to stay alive. It is not like a theoretical you know, methodology or framework that I am considering. Mm -hmm. No, if I do not spend more time visioning and building and sourcing my own vitality, I will die. And that is individually, and that is also speaking collectively. That is what has happened. And that death is not like a just only just a literal passing away. 
but it's also living in a very small way that really isn't living at all. It might be surviving, but it's not thriving. It's actually the way the enemy wins. Um, so yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> But, but now that we yeah. turned over the third card, um, what else though? What more? I want to say a little bit more about this yeah. one. So this this could be a week of talk. Yeah. Um, but I absolutely agree with you about, about the importance of vision. I think that I use a metaphor a lot about that, that those of us who are trying to create sustainable life on Earth mm -hmm. have one have to have a foot in the present and a foot in the future. Yes, we have to have the realism of what it is that's right in front of us that we got to deal with. But if we don't have a vision that's big enough, then the metaphor I use is, is that we need to steer by the stars while our feet are in the mud. That the mud of the present moment requires some slogging through. You got to have good boots. You got to deal with what's right here. But if your vision isn't big enough and high enough, you can't really steer a, by it across rough terrain. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I say when I'm brought in to speak to activist groups of different kinds is, is that counterintuitive as we've come to believe it is, it is far easier to organize people behind a really big vision than behind a small one. That when we ask for too little, we don't engage people's passion, people's real desires, people's real hope. Yeah. And that what oppressive societies do is shrink imagination. Yes. And our job is to expand imagination and say something bigger, something bigger. What, what would a society have to be like for the various physical conditions that are considered disabilities currently not to be disabling? Mm -hmm. Disability comes from society's beliefs, not from the body. The body has challenges. Society makes those disabling mm -hmm. by, for instance, ins insisting on standardized paces of work, mm -hmm. which means a narrow range of bodies can work at that particular pace, insisting that only certain kinds of things are productive. Who is, dis is decreed to be disabled varies tremendously from time to time and place to place. It's a social idea. What would society have to look like for it not to be disabling to have a spinal cord injury? Um, on the other side of that, I look at all kinds of things that happen to our bodies that are not considered to be environmental in nature, and are not considered to be social, but are thought of as accidental, but are not. Somebody who gets a spinal cord injury as a result of a car accident is actually a victim of an economic structure that requires speed. Mm -hmm. Speed is not an innate human need. Um, work that is structured in centralized ways with people living far away, a work schedule and demands upon us that require us to rush. There is, the, people don't actually have a biological need to zoom around at 55 miles an hour or more. So a person who's injured with a spinal cord injury is injured by the, the entire economic structure. It's not an accident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have what's called environmental illness. I am extremely reactive to toxic chemicals around me. I also have epilepsy, and my epilepsy is connected to the pesticides used on my parents' farm in Puerto Rico in the 1950s that were repurposed nerve gas from World War II. So my epilepsy is an environmental illness, although no doctor has ever asked me about chemical exposure. It is an illness of militarism. It's an illness of colonialism. We need to really expand our notions of all of those concepts. So when, when, when I see a question that says, how does climate change and environmental trauma affect our bodies, mm -hmm. I say, how doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, there's something else. Well, if it matters, it will but, but the sense of, a, of a, the need to have a really big vision for what's possible and also, I think, to cultivate resilience. Resilience. You know, resilience. I hear a lot about people wanting safe spaces and, yes. you know, guarantees. And mm -hmm. safety is a privileged concept. OK? Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of safety going around in the world. But resilience allows us to confront a wide variety of situations and come up with creative responses to them. Sure. Yeah. And in the face of what 
greed and alienation from the natural world has perpetrated on our planet, we need great imagination and great resilience. Mm -hmm. We could, we could stay right here. We could stay right here. I'm actually, I wasn't done. I wasn't done. Please, once, yeah, I please, please, please. Okay, when we say, how does it affect our bodies, that implies that our bodies are affected equally. And our bodies are not affected equally. Mm -hmm. Environmental trauma affects different groups of people very, very differently. And, and the people who have been rendered most vulnerable by unequal distributions of wealth and access are way more impacted, way faster, way harder, way sooner. Malaria is a disease of environmental destruction. The deforestation of vast tracts of West Africa drives mosquitoes out of deep forest into proximity with human beings. Malaria is one of the biggest killers on Earth. It's an environment, it is a disease of climate change. It is a disease of environmental destruction. So when we say our bodies, I'm going, okay, well, let's differentiate a little bit here. Different bodies are being hit different ways different rates. I'm going to put this, card? we should, I'm going to put this card over here. Because yeah, I feel like it's going to come back. I'm going to come back. Yeah. We're going to read Yeah, yeah, okay. I think you're going to take the card. Is it my turn? Okay. I think so. What does reimagining our bodies mean to you? Yes, I, this, is, this is great. This is really <laughs> <laughs> because I was just thinking if, if if the question if question three came back to me, then I would just want to meditate for a moment on my body, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and my body beyond trauma, my body, you know, my my particular body and the body that is the community that I'm accountable to, mm -hmm. the communities I'm accountable to. Um, what would I say to my baby niece about her body uh, as she is learning what it means? What, 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 is, what, is, the, what is the value of, of imagination as it relates to connecting ourselves, remembering, reconnecting to um, this, this physical thing and also all of the spaces around us? Um, but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something that I did not we did not talk about. So I'm just letting <laughs> all of the organizers and coordinators know that I'm about to go off script <laughs> in the most respectful way. Um, but I want I want to I want to just ask for some one word responses. When you think of the word reimagine, what word comes for you uh, for you? Say it as loud as you can. Honestly. Body. Colors. Change. Oh. Expansion. Wealth. Freedom. Freedom. Joy. Sorry. Community. Community. Transformation. All of those words um, are generative and fertile and rich and um, come from a space of expansiveness and opportunity and growth and reach and creative and creativity. And when I think about reimagining our bodies, I think about all of those things, actually, I really do. Mm -hmm. um, I think about uh, connectivity. <coughs> um, quite often, I think about connectivity. I think that's the world that I, and collaboration. That's the world that I live in most often, is being in spaces with people who are, who are wanting to bring more beauty into the world, mm -hmm. figuring out what, how to do that. And the idea that artists are conjurers in, in a way, in a lot of ways, where we can take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a lot of emotion and a lot of uh, multi-sensory ability and extra sensory perception and make something that wasn't there before. Imagination and reimagination and re-reimagination and re-re-reimagination 
is an opportunity um, within the body and beyond within the body and along with everything else that we we can we can touch to be in a space of of, of embodying um, um, uh, vision and and being beyond trauma that I think is a medicine uh, I really do I think it's a medicine. I think uh, reimagining our collective body means that we see each other and seeing not just being about eyesight, mm. but we sense each other and we are connected um, in a way that we don't want, we don't feel like the bees are still in the pot, you know? We are here together. Um, and it's up, up, up to us to, con to nurture that, that connected space. And I, yeah, I, I, could, I could go on and on. And I really, I, I haven't seen these questions yet, so I am kind of like, you know, reaching and grabbing, but it's interesting to be in the space of answering it, these questions now, because I feel like I'm always in a space of reimagining. Every time I, sit down with a group of people to have a conversation about building a cultural opportunity, it is not, it's from a space of vision, it's from a space of connection, it's from a, a space of, of um, opportunity, um, generativeness, uh, being a space of fertility. And I think all of that, that comes to mind for me when I think about imagining my body and imagining the collective bodies that um, we encounter every day. Ah, that was gorgeous. I'm feeling very poetic today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just feeling like in the metaphor. <laughs> we were talking backstage about I was saying that I think of the metaphor as my tool of analysis. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a method of noticing relationships. So lucky that it's my tool. It's a great tool. I want to answer this um, in a more specific way, although I could also go on and on, to talk a little bit about the work I do in what's called the disability justice movement, which is different than the disability rights movement, which is much more narrowly focused. And it's really a question about bodies in general and how we define all, all the stories that are heaped upon our bodies that define what's okay and what isn't okay. Um, what's considered disabled and what's considered abled, what's considered ill and what's considered healthy are deeply distorted by all kinds of social forces. And as I've been doing more and more work in that area, I do a lot of writing workshops with disabled and chronically ill people. I see how profoundly important the voices of those people are in this question of reimagining our bodies. Because people with, with disabilities and chronic illnesses have bodies that do not allow us to comply mm -hmm. with a lot of the rules of bodies in the society. And because of that, we're forced to face questions of what is worthwhile in a body, what isn't. What do we mean when we say, well, I'm somebody whose body reacts in very unpredictable and unstable ways to what's around me. Uh, all our bodies are reacting to what's around, but my body shouts about perfume. It shouts about the 500 chemicals in the fragrance in the fabric softener. Um, and I've had to reinvent for myself what I mean by being productive. <coughs> I spent five years lying in bed, watching a whole lot of Netflix, mm -hmm. and really having very little social contact. I was sick, I was poor, I was isolated. And recently, I've been engaging in new kinds of work and realizing, wow, I was thinking about that when I was lying in bed. Mm -hmm. That's, that was the fertile ground from which these ideas that I'm putting out in the world now came. That was actually productive time. That's not something we're taught. We're taught very narrow standards of what's valuable to society. I have also the, 
the not so common in this country experience of having been a patient in the Cuban medical system. I went to Cuba to receive rehab treatment after a stroke. And as I was preparing to go there, I decided to research a little bit about the clinic I was going to, and I read some of their papers, and there was a paper about medical ethics. And it was talking about what do you do when you have a patient who's a really good candidate for rehab, their family supported, but they don't want to do it. And, and the person writing was saying, well, you know, you need to respect their sovereignty, and at the same time, you have to explain to them that each human being is unique, that people are not interchangeable, and that their specific gifts, that if they refuse the opportunity to heal from an injury and become more able to share their gifts, that they're depriving themselves, their family, and society as a whole. So that was right while I was getting turned down for SSI in the States. I like, okay, pack of papers this big saying, prove that, that you deserve any help at all, and that we're not wasting our resources on you, which we kind of know we are anyway. You know, there's a sense that people are interchangeable, and really the measure is how soon are you going to be able to get back to work? And in Cuba, the notion was we can't afford to do without any of our individual gifted people. We have no idea what they could bring to the table, and so we need to make sure everybody is cultivated. It's, much, it's specific. So that's part of the reimagining is to kind of re-examine the uniqueness of each of us. But also, I think that there's a lot of leadership that sick and disabled people can bring to this conversation about what we discover as we explore our own truths and argue with the medical establishment and you know, wrestle with diagnoses and with ambiguities that the medical system doesn't like. People with chronic illness, and particularly the newer chronic illnesses, often get really mistreated in the medical system because we have a model of this thing caused this illness and this pill will cure it. My body is sick from 21st century and 20th century capitalism. I have a wide range of ways that my body was not able to adapt to the toxicity of that. And that toxicity includes the colonial occupation of my country. It includes what it was like to be a Puerto Rican girl right in the United States at the age of 13. It includes a whole range of things that, that, that my body didn't have enough resilience to handle. So as we tell specific stories of body trauma, there's also clues in there about what reimagining resilience and healing can look like. So I'm, I'm really excited to bring forth more of those voices and see what people who currently imagine themselves as able-bodied and well can learn from those of us who are not. So that's one piece of it.
So this opportunity to say more, I think, is really uh, awesome. How does disability ability relate to how we think about the environment? Mm. I have been working very slowly on a really big book that's all about that. And part of what I've been thinking about is that in some traditional societies, there's way less distinction between body and environment than what we currently live with. There's an understanding that the skin is not the barrier we think it is, that we're constantly exchanging our body with the environment, and that when we become ill, when we become disabled, that it's actually not limited to, it's not just happening inside the bag of the skin. It, it's a disruption in relationships. <laughs> and in fact, I coined a word based on the language of the Taino people of Puerto Rico, Guanacan, which means our center, as a word to mean mind, body, and ecosystem, mm. all in one. Because when I reimagine my body, when I expand my vision, I understand myself to be a lot less bounded individually than I've been taught to think. Mm. And environmental, what was it, how was it working? How does, how does this, oh, the other question no, or this question? Not. Yeah, how does disability and ability think, relate to how right. you think about it? Disability and illness are kind of disruptions in the expected relationship between an individual body and an environment. Can you it, say that, it, again? That, that disability and illness are both disruptions of the relationship we expect to have with our environment. We expect to be able to move through it at will. We expect to be able to proceed with the sen with five senses. We expect to be able to breathe easily. Um, we expect to be free of pain. And then something disrupts that, and so it, it does bring a heightened awareness of, of what's around us. Um, there's something I'm reaching for, but I'm not quite wrapping my mind around, so I'm gonna take a minute. For me, I, I, I really wish I had brought my laptop instead of leaving it at the hotel because there's a snippet I would read to you about how when I struggle with illness, sometimes it feels unbearable. I want to just vacate my body so I don't have to pay attention. And what allows me to push past that is to extend my senses, to really perceive my body as part of a web that is both traumatized and resilient. Mm -hmm. I, my body is, I have disabilities that have to do with having landed on my head during seizures. I extend my senses outward and think about the way the environment impinged on my body to make that happen. I, I, I think a lot about my body and my land and how we were injured in similar ways. I think about, I spend a lot of time imagining my body as soil. I imagine the regeneration of, the, of my body and the reforestation of the mountains of Western Puerto Rico. I think about the toxins in the water table there and the things in my liver. And as I expand that sense of relationship with the natural world, I feel empowered. I, I sense a huge web that is struggling for resilience in the face of trauma. So for me, disability, and I think for a lot of people, you know, it depends on the dis what people bring to it and what the disability is, but certainly for people with chronic illness, I think there's an open, an open door into more perception of relationship with environment. This is something that the Chicana writer Gloria Ansaldúa wrote about a lot. She wrote a lot about the state of awareness that comes from being broken in that way, from being kind of forced open to perceive relationships that we can just sort of trundle through life not noticing. 
So for me personally, illness and disability open that sense kind of out of necessity. I feel like if I if I if I limit my perception to this body, it feels overwhelming. And when I extend out, I see both greater damage and greater resource, yeah. and greater possibility. The um, I mean, this quote's been coming to my head a lot this week. The, the Salvadoran poet Roque Dalton has a long poem that ends, all together they have more death than we, but all together we have more life than they. Mm. When I reach with my sick body outward, I tap all that life. Mm. That's the big nature of that. But I want you to notice that I struggled with this first because I was up here in my head. Mm -hmm. And then I went, wait a minute. And I went like this. Mm -hmm. I was like, OK, what does my body actually want to say about this right now? Mm -hmm. So that was that process that we were talking about earlier of the body as a compass, the body as a place of checking the accuracy of what's happening here in the front of the world. How are some of the dynamics you bring to your artwork, race and gender, for example, connected to our climate slash environment? <laughs> So I've had the privilege and the honor to be a part of building collect women um, artist collectives around the country. Mostly uh, folks interested in performance, um, theatrical performance and cultural performance, um, and mostly women of color and black women. Um, and uh, I have done this where I'm from, in Houston, I've done this in D.C., here in New York, in North Carolina, and I've been a part of um, institutions and cultural organizations reaching uh, to do this type of local intimate work in terms of performance with uh, people of color. It's challenging work and also very troubling quite often, I'll be very <coughs> honest with you, to do this work in the midst of all of the environmental traumas that we are um, living in. Um, but it's also very gratifying work, and I really believe that it's a part of why I'm here in this time, um, is to, to gather women and uh, create sacred space for us to imagine beyond our trauma and to then take that, that, those, that uh, imagination to public uh, spaces. And so, um, so the dynamics, the elements, the ways in which the processes um, that I use uh, really come from um, the front porch, and I'll talk a little bit about that, the kitchen table. Um, uh, they're not learned in a way like, oh yes, and then I took this course at NYU on experimental poetics and black women's blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I did that, but that's not where I learned these dynamics that I'm being asked to discuss. Um, it really, I think, you know, one, what has been coming up for me as we've been talking is my relationship to my mother, which I think is, um, one of the, the, the first relationships I ever experienced that was so full of life and so full of challenge, um, all wrapped up in one individual, one human being. And I think um, um, some of these, these, these uh, the, what we're talking about, I think, you know, I'm leaning in to listening because I, I hear it resonate and really, like you and my mom would just, be, I'm sure y'all could just have conversations for days. Um, she's a brilliant woman and also some of these things around health and, and uh, wellness and what that means and who gets to decide. Um, I think she would have a lot to say about, not to me, but I think she would enjoy talking to you um, about some of these things. So it feels, <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. So it feels good to hear some of the, the, 
the, the I, I know the conversations that my mom and I haven't been able to have, um, I'm able to hear today. So it's very much, you know, yeah, it's, it's, I'm really thankful. I'm really thankful. Um, and it's a learning for me and an opening for me, so I'm, I'm very thankful. But those dynamics specifically that ask black women to be more in connection with each other um, are sometimes the hardest uh, part of making artwork in the communities, you know, that, that I make work with. And um, we've talked, we've already, we've like outlined why, you know, we've outlined or we're talked about, well, everybody's body isn't impacted in the same way. And if you think about um, black women within the cultural, political, social landscape, environment, ecology of this country, Imagine, just for a moment, and I actually want to just take a pause and have you imagine how these dynamics play out in, that, in, in, the, in these communities of black women. And then on top of that, to be expected or to want to or to say, yes, and we will still be creative forces in, this, in our communities. We will still make art. We will still perform our stories on the street. We won't be silenced. We won't be invisibilized. We will tell our stories in public. And you will contend with our brilliance. What? Where, where do they make these kind of people? Really? Like, to, to for, for so much to say, go away, you know? And for, for these communities of women to say, hell no, really, we, you will see us, um, it's absolutely the, uh, the unmitigated gall of black women. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, <laughs> yes, yes. You know, and I'm being very local, and I know in being specific to talking about communities of black women, there is connection in this room. Um, but through my experience, those dynamics of stepping up Stepping in, being visible, being 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 scary in some ways to the large to the dominant structure are dynamics that I have in my pocket, in my pocketbook, so to speak. And as a daughter of a woman who took no shit from anybody, who takes no shit from anybody, and her four sisters and my grandmother and my great-grandmother, who I've had in my life for most of my life, I come from a lineage of women who, while dealing with trauma, while dealing with the reality of Jim Crow South in the 50s, 40s, and beyond, while, and, and also while getting graduate degrees and doctorate degrees and traveling the world and making families and raising babies and loving and living, like all of these things that we, we, we've been talking about, we are here and we are here. We, it's not a binary. We are an ecology um, in, in each body and in our collective. Those dynamics are not, are, are, are not just about how to make it through the day. Those are the elements of my art practice and the art practices of the people who I get to make art with. We come to the table and the first thing we say is, we, we know is that we're supposed to be there. We are not marginalizing ourselves and saying, oh, we have a story to tell, but we're not gonna say that, but, you know. No, those people are around, but the people that I make art with are, are bodacious, <laughs> you know? And, and, and it is because in, in, the, in the communities that I'm a part of, art is, is a tool, is a strategy, is a method, is a recipe, for revolution and liberation. Yeah. Evolution, revolution, and liberation. Yes. So we come together and we're like, okay, we're supposed to be here. We have a story to tell. We have an agenda to move forward. It's very pointed. It's not, you know, this is, these are people who are strategic artists. Mm -hmm. These are people who are strategists. And the way, they, the way they activate their strategy is through art. I get, I get to work at here in this, in this moment, I get to work at the National <coughs> Black Theater. Everybody know where that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Great. Everyone knows who Dr. Barbara Antier is? No. Hallelujah. If you don't, 
Google Dr. Barbara Ann Tier and then take yourself to 125th and 5th and find out more about this cultural revolutionary that refused to put black people's stories on the back burner. She worked on Broadway, could have totally done that and did that and started an institution that's still here and still thriving and still putting, centering the stories and the lives and the experiences of people of color um, at the center of their season. Very important work. And so I think, I mean, I could talk, I could talk, I could talk about this for a long time, but those dynamics of resilience, of vitality, of taking what's in the cupboard and feeding a whole neighborhood, that's the people I come from. Mm. And that's the art that I make. Whether it's on the street, whether it's in a school, whether it's on the stage, whether it's, you know, I, who cares? I don't, it doesn't matter because it's not just, it's not, the art, art is not like in quotations. Art is life. Art is practice, art is relationship, art is building, art is cultivating, art is love, art is spirituality, art is a holistic ecology of possibility. Um, and within that, you know, I, I never shy away from the body that I'm in, the experience that I'm having. It's, it's, it nourishes. It makes it even richer, you know. Um, I'll say this and then I'll pause. Um, a couple of days ago, I, I taught a day-long workshop, um, which, well, actually, I didn't do all the teaching. I let folks teach themselves, right? Popular <laughs> education style. Um, but um, after the workshop, there was a gentleman outside, and he had he has this cultural campaign called Very Black. <laughs> Google it; it's called Very Black. And um, and I know him, and so we were just you know talking. And he was like, "Kent, would you take a picture with my Very Black sticker?" And I was like, "Of course." You know, and, and I took a picture, posted it on Facebook, like 150 people liked the picture. That's important, but not important. But it is important because I, I live in a world where being in this body is not considered the standard or the norm of beauty by some. It is for me <laughs> and the people that love me and the people I love. But you know, so the idea that this platform be black be as black, as very black as you can be, exists, I was like, oh my gosh, what a wonderful opportunity to let the world know that uh, I'm down with that, you know? And so those dynamics of, again, of resilience, of, um, of being bold and radical and loving and nurturing and um, present, um, yeah. All of that. I want to piggyback on that yes. briefly. Yeah, I come from those people in the Latino community. Yes. What, what does that say? I can't read it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well. Okay. <laughs> Transition to the q and Yeah, but first I'm going to say something. <laughs> um, I just want to say I came two weeks ago from um, being in Indiana with 14 Latina feminist writers who 20 years ago got a grant to do some boring academic thing and got into the room with each other and went around and said, let's tell a little bit of our life stories and saw how much we had had to fight for a space for our thinking and our voices and said, yeah, well, we're really writing the grant. And what we did instead was each other's life histories. We created a book called Telling to Live, Latina Feminist Testimonio. It's its 20th anniversary of that project. So we were invited to speak at Notre Dame University, and we walked into this auditorium and said, okay, well, put up an altar, draped fabric all over everything, yeah. rearranged the chairs, and instead of a panel on testimonial writing, um, did this thing where we were going back and forth and speaking poetically and yes. in doing invocation and doing what you're talking about, yes. and grounded in our bodies, the pain, the resilience, the beauty making, the persistence, the we're not asking anybody. We're here and we're gonna say these things in every single space we can drive a wedge into an open crack. That's, that's the ground of 
our bodies, our lives, our survival, our, our, our resilience. Mm -hmm. So those women. My mama was my co-author for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She didn't take any shit either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she wrote a master's thesis on the racism of, of the great god of anthropology, Claude Levi Strauss. She got kicked out of anthropology for it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're gonna do some it's audience. audience. Okay. Y'all here with us? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Anybody people are can... taking notes. I see people yeah. taking notes. Are y'all tweeting? Are y'all? Did y'all do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're present. You're here with us. <laughs> And there's something that you've been carrying around in here in your chest that you want to say. A question, maybe in your belly. I want to see who all is going to jump. Because, some, because certain people raise their hands first always. So I want to pause a minute and kind of see who's holding back and who's jumping. Can you see them? Can you? I, I mean, I can see them, but uh, sort of. I, I only see one hand over here. There's another hand over there. Two guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just notice. <laughs> How many questions do we have time for? Here? Two. <laughs> well, they're not going to both be light skinned boys. <laughs> so let's wait a minute and see who else has a question. Okay, I see a hand right here. I see a hand back here. <laughs> she just can't see me. Okay. okay. Are I you, know. I'm like coffee. Sure. Her question first, and then see who else. Hi, thank you so much. I actually never ask questions, so good. Can you all hear the question? Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> I think a lot about violence. I think about, um, as a Puerto Rican woman, I am also a survivor of the trafficking industry. Um, I look at the history of my country and sexual violence and environmental violence have been like this from day one. And in fact, the environmental violence in the Caribbean was framed as sexual violence. The landscape is spoken of as a female body being being captured um, in the earliest days by the Spanish. But when the U.S. invaded in 1898, they said the fertile Kirby Hills of Puerto Rico were surrendering to the Bureau of Marines. So there's a great narrative of environmental violence that goes back 500 years. Trauma is the are the tracks of the violence, but. But yeah, I think it's really important to talk about it. it it's more fashionable, and so trauma has become fashionable. It's good that people are thinking about trauma, but trauma is the footprints of the violence perpetrated. And, and yes, you're right, it's really important to name violence as violence. Mm -hmm. And to name the clear cutting of the slopes of, of Western Puerto Rico to plant a cheaper variety. Between the ability of large numbers of people to sell children and young women for sexual violence and the ability to decimate the planet. There's a disconnect. This is our young. This is our, the, the children of humanity being sold, commodified, exploited, often dying in the process. Um, for a species to be able to do that to its young requires an extraordinary amount of, of violent disruption of relation. And so to me, that's completely in, intertwined with the, the same mentality does that to children as, as you know, decides that we can clear cut the Amazon. And that even though it will mean that we have no air, it's still worth putting that into a Swiss bank account. Mm -hmm. So, but I also, I mean, I think of, of every aspect of that mentality as violence. Poverty is violence. Shortage of food is violence. All of it is violence. Anything that is not nurturance is is in some way violence because alienation is violent. It's a, it's a it's a severing of the ties that sustain life. And I frankly think that 
we're all in a kind of PTSD state around the loss of our bonds with the natural world and with one another. Um, I think about the people who perpetrate these crimes must be in a state of horrific orphanage from the, the kinship of, of humanity and the planet. That must be deep, deeply intolerable to live that way and people must be incredibly numb to be able to tolerate doing those things. One more question You take this one. Oh, okay. Questions? Beautiful people. Is there a question here? Um, I, I, have, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, and it's actually kind of a follow-up. I was, I, was, I was thinking about trauma while you guys were talking, too. Because there were, there were kind of three words that kept recurring for, for me as I was listening, like bells. You know, and um, you know, resilience, imagination, and trauma. And, it, and, in one, and, and in one case, it was, you know, um, it was in your metaphor, it was resilience and imagination. And then at another at another moment you were saying you faced the day with, with, you know with, through resilience and trauma and I wondered if you were if you were um, if there is a relationship to trauma and the imagination in that sense or if you or, or if there's a way to think about that relationship. <laughs> okay, you take it now. The relationship between resilience and trauma. Or trauma, trauma and imagination. Trauma and imagination. Yeah. Give me a moment. <laughs> the relationship between trauma and imagination. Um, I mean, the, the, the short answer, and, and I will explicate, but the short answer is, well, of course there's a relationship between trauma and imagination. Um, and for me, of, of course there is a relationship for me. Um, and I think that relationship or that connectivity um, was sparked in me at a very young age. Um, and I think, uh, I know, I remember being able to express things through art, through painting, through poetry, that I couldn't express in conversation with the people who um, were experiencing the trauma um, most directly. Um, so, that, so that imagination in some ways becomes an opportunity to step outside of the present moment and um, consider the nuances that are happening and taking place. For me, I've seen that, and I've also seen that in the, in the communities that I live in, that the space to imagine is sometimes relegated to the last five minutes of the agenda, or of the program, or of the project, of, you know, and that is where we need to be most often, is mm -hmm. taking that, um, that break uh, to, to breathe in a different way, to experience in a different way, and to understand what's going on. It is, for me, it's, I'm not able to really um, um, metabolize trauma if I'm in a fight or flight space. Uh, I'm not able to understand and figure out what's happening to, uh, my body is shut down. Uh, and I'm saying my body and I'm also saying the collective body. But the opportunity um, to, em to think about uh, police violence and all of that, um, people are coming together at their wits end wanting to figure out how, what to do with their trauma. Do we just come together and talk? Do we make another nonprofit? Do we write a play? Do we do this? What do we do? We don't know. We don't know. And what I'm experiencing right now in Harlem um, is um, how how long term the long term impact of trauma on imagination. And these are these are groups of artists coming together that can't breathe, like literally, that can't breathe. Um, long enough before there is another trauma. Yeah. 
So the, the space of imagination becomes impaired in a way because of the constant threat of attack. Yes. So, and I said this earlier, yes. and I think we've been, we've, we've been talking about this. So imagination becomes not, it, 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 is, it is a revolutionary practice for some, but it's also a visionary practice. Mm -hmm. It's also taking back that space in our bodies from the capitalist state, from state violence, and, and using that time and that energy to imagine, to, to build something else. But I will say that this is all very flowery and talk. In practice, I know folks that have been on, on the front lines in Ferguson, on the front lines here, on the front lines all over the world. And when you ask them to imagine, they look at you like you are crazy, like you're talking crazy talk, like you're talking beyond the, the scope of possibility. Like you need, like they look at me like I need help. Because the day of life says that that is not a possibility. Even for artists, even for people who spend the bulk of their time in an imagination, in an imaginative space. And so, you know, I'm talking around, I don't have an answer, I'm just like sharing what I'm feeling right now, that for some people, this, this, you know, this space of imagination, the practice of imagining, is a privilege when you do not know if you're going to be shot dead in the street in the next moment. Uh, and so it becomes, you know, you know, I mean, it's, it's difficult. It sounds good to talk about. It sounds good to, to think about the opportunity and the options. And I know some folks that, some of my people who will be watching this live stream and will, have, will take issue, will say, right now is the time to fight. Right now is the time to revolt. Right now is the time to, make our, to shore up our communities and make them safe. Right now is not the time for poetry. Mm -hmm. Right now is not the time for, for, for visioning. Right now is the time for surviving. And so, you know, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm also, I also know that there are, there are people that, that, are, that I love who, um, who are not there. They can't, they can't be there right now. The reality is they can't be there right now. <clears throat> There's always the danger that urgency will drown possibility. Yeah that the mud at our feet is up to our knees, and who has time to go start with? But if we're gonna walk out of the mud, we need to have a direction. I, I yes, 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 and. After the earthquake in Haiti, Cuba sent a bunch of med uh, medical teams to help. They were on the ground already because they were doing work there, building the medical infrastructure, but they sent a bunch of medical teams, and they decided to send some teams of artists. Yes. And the artists' plan had been to do some work with Haitian artists and get some community art going to process the trauma. Mm -hmm. While they were at it, they did a workshop for the kids who were living in tents in the park and didn't know where their families were. Mm -hmm. And they thought they were going to do that once as a side thing. Well, the kids revolted and said, no, you have to do this every day. <laughs> In the middle of all the horror of what was happening, they started having art programs in, in the refugee camps throughout Port-au-Prince. And the Cuban doctor said it was the first time they had been able to attend to bodies and souls simultaneously. And that the way that those things interacted with each other greatly enhanced the power of both. So I won't put that story on the table. I also am in a really lovely project called We Are Not Numbers, where writers in the United States are mentoring young writers in Gaza who want to write in English and talk about what their experiences are. And so I'm receiving poetry from young writers who are talking about writing in their journals, writing stories in their journals as the shelves are falling. So you know that question of whether we can embrace imagination in the moment, I think it depends on a lot of different Factors mm -hmm. and and com community support for that, and also you know there's certain kinds of emergencies where you, there's so little sense of control 
that sometimes maybe nothing is left but to try to imagine your way out. I mean, look at the massive literature of prison poetry yes. over, over centuries, yes. to yes. people in extreme circumstances turning to poetry. And um, I know of one story in, in fascist Spain of a, of a prisoner giving a book of poetry to a prison authority who, after reading it, could no longer do his job, was not able to continue abusing prisoners and managing um, but I wanted to say about trauma and imagination that I think of it that violence writes a story on us. It says you are a person to whom this may be done. Hmm. And that our imagination takes that wound. But that in the telling, retelling of the story and claiming it and putting ourselves in a, in a different role, we can rewrite, we can rename ourselves as I am someone to whom this was done mm -hmm. and who is healing and who is coming back. And that, so for me, imagination and trauma deeply linked and critical part of, of addressing trauma is specifically the healing of imagination, specifically opening up that space that you're saying that some of the frontline people you work with can't imagine, can't hold off the urgency of the, of the danger and the violence coming up of long enough to create that. You know, how do we as artists open up even tiny little spaces. Mm -hmm. You know, a poem on a wall that's two lines mm -hmm. can impact somebody on their way to the trenches, to the yes. front lines. Yes. How do, you know, what's the song we sing as we walk down the street? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure those songs embody something beyond just fight, fight, fight? Fight is important when we've been taught not to fight, but imagining winning is, is incredibly important for our immune systems in the largest sense. Mm -hmm. That to sustain ourselves, we have to have some cellular belief in the possibility that struggle leads to something. Mm -hmm. That struggle is not just a state of permanent, a permanent state of being. Mm -hmm. that, that there are possibilities. We have 15 more minutes. There's a song that, um, there's, a, there's an institution in New Market, Tennessee, called the Highlander Center. If you don't know about Highlander, you should Google Highlander Center for Research and Education at New Market, Tennessee. It's been around about 80 years. And one of the pieces of work that I do um, is I serve on a committee called the We Shall Overcome Fund, which is responsible for redistributing the royalties from that song back into black communities, um, led and uh, organizations led by people who are doing work for the liberation of black folks, okay? So that's a big job, that's a big job. Um, and every year we have something called Cultural Workers Weekend, which is um, led by the lead, the, the lead cultural organizer at Highlander, Tafar Waller Muhammad, and um, at one of our convenings recently, um, uh, well, not actually, not recently, I learned this song. And I think it really kind of encapsulates for me an answer to that question. It's basically the song says, um, we, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We will not, um, we will not stop and we won't turn around. We'll flood the streets with justice. We are freedom now. Mm. And um, I think, you know, that song, that, that song, and we would sing it and sing it and sing it until we just get overcome with the understanding that in the space of state trauma, in the space of trauma, in the space of state violence, in the, in the space, in, a, in, the, in the world that we live in, we won't stop. We will not stop. We, are, we won't stop. We are going to flood the streets with justice. We are freedom bound. Um, and so, yeah. Mm. And what that's is the start? Yes, that's the start. Yes, that's the start. Mm. What do we use these last 15 minutes to do? <laughs> We've got, there's a lot of things. I like this one. What do you got? I have like, I have like a trading cards here. I, I dropped one. <laughs> well, this one is interesting in the realm of <coughs> How does the human body build a cooperative relationship with I, I saw that question too. What else do you have there? 
that will allow Monsanto and other GM producing companies to contaminate the, the gene pool of seeds without any consequences whatsoever. They're going to say organic farmers have to pay into a fund and compensate themselves when their crops are contaminated. Mm -hmm. There is a danger that the spread of patented seed genes will spread into the plant population and render plants sterile. They were designed to be sterile because they're, they're trying to create a monopoly on all food. So, you know, there's urgent actions to be taken and we need to take them from this place of respect and reverence for the rest of life, and not just, oh my God, the food supply, but <coughs> people and our imaginations are the greatest untapped natural resource on the planet with the capacity to stop what's happening. You know, the bees aren't gonna be able to stop it by themselves. So that's a piece of an impassioned speech that could go on for three days. Aurora, can you talk about Anthropocene and what I don't even know what that means. I don't know what it means either. What is that? We're <laughs> reading different books. <laughs> I think is that like the like human created era or something? I don't know what it is. Philippe, you know what it is. Can you share it? I think we have other things we have to talk about. Well, but you wanted to say something. Well, I, I, would, I, would know, I think you answered that beautifully. I don't need to. If we, if we have more time, then th does anyone else have a question? I see a hand right here. Is, uh, please. So, uh, I, first of all, I really appreciate the conversation. And um, we've been, you've been talking, uh, I like about uh, this, a lot of the challenges we're facing, both uh, individually and as a community and also as a species. And I would be curious, both of you, to know, um, from you to know uh, what gives you hope. That's a great way to end this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. I'll, um, I'll, I'll say a few things about that. I would love to hear your response. Um, I think the, the work that I get to do as a cultural strategist, as an artist, and as a community educator um, um, allows me to be with young people. Um, and I mean, one of, the, one of the projects that I'm working on right now is about building cultural bridges between toddlers and cultural institutions. Mm -hmm. Like, how can we get more three-year-olds to the Metropolitan Museum? Seriously. And so, um, so when I am around three-year-olds making um, masks and crowns, about their self-determination, that represent their self-determination, um, I know, I know that, um, that there is more to this moment than what boxes us in, in terms of um, um, violence or trauma or any other type of precarious position that we're placed in as folks. Um, when, when I am in this, when there, so a couple of weeks ago, I led this jam, this performance jam session, and there was about 15 people there, and everyone at first was kind of like performing, and then we got to a sweet spot, mm. where the performance stopped, and we were all in breath with each other, and we were all sweating, and we were all connected, and that, if we could just let that ride out for, you know, <laughs> forever. Mm -hmm. um, if we could tap into what that means, that generative space, and, and infuse it into every aspect of our lives, we can. We can. Mm -hmm. We can. That's what gives me hope, is the experiences I get to have, you know, that are very intimate and personal and, um, and transcendent. Um, and I'm not the only one having those experiences. I decided a long time ago that it was part of my responsibility as a radical and as an artist to, to take care of my hope, um, to cultivate it, to collect hopeful stories, um, and also to limit the amount of horror that I allowed in my awareness. I 
don't open the emails that say, see horrible video of gross violence, urgent, urgent, watch it now. Um, the bad news is very repetitive. Mm -hmm. Violence is violence, corruption is corruption, war is war, massacres are massacres, torture is torture. It doesn't add anything to my consciousness to read the latest thing. I read the headline, I go, okay, it's happening over there. Mm -hmm. I don't need the details in my field of awareness. Good news tends to be far more varied and interesting. And I collect stories of people getting each other's backs in unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. I collect stories of people coming up with creative and generous solutions to problems. I collect stories like the fact that the Venezuelan government has been gathering weapons that it captures from people in the drug trade and organized crime, disorganized <coughs> crime, and also incentivizing people turning in weapons. And once a year, they melt down the guns, turn them into steel bars, and use them to build houses for poor people. Mm -hmm. That gives me chills every time. Wow. Um, the people of Gaza sent aid to the people of Haiti. Mm -hmm. How beautiful is that? The Choctaw Nation, fresh off of being driven out of the southeast and into Oklahoma, sent aid to Irish famine victims in the 1840s. A hundred years later, Irish Americans approached the, the Choctaw Nation and said, we have collected 100, no, a thousand times the, initial, the original donation you sent us, which was $710, and started a foundation against hunger. Will you help us run it? Mm. Those are the kinds of stories that I collect for my own well-being and also to share them. I draw tremendous amounts of hope from what's happening in Latin America. And one of my deep frustrations is how insulated the population of the United States is um, from news about that. Do you, how many people here are aware of the fact that the Bolivian government has a vice ministry of decolonization? <laughs> or that or that the education department in Bolivia has decided that to train teachers differently, that the three things that are most important for, for students in, in Bolivia to be learning are Latin American history with an emphasis on indigenous history and culture, ecology, and solidarity. Um, <laughs> and that those are the subject matters most significant for, for Bolivian survival in the 21st century. You know, stories like that, when people invent their ways out of narrow places, mm -hmm. I gather them as medicine. Mm -hmm. And I tincture them and I hand them out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and when hopelessness overcomes me, which happens periodically to all of us, when I feel discouraged, when something slams me, I call somebody up. Mm -hmm. I don't sit with it alone. Is that um, Clarissa Pinkola Estes who says it, that this bear may, may come into the house, but that she doesn't set a plate for it at the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I reach out to somebody and I, I go find a source. I tune into Telesur TV, which will ha occasionally has amazing stories about the restoration of land to indigenous people or housewives get pensions in Venezuela. Just things that people have figured out. Um, some of them small, some of them really big. And, and I think we should all be doing that. I think we should be gathering and trading our hopeful stories. Because we need to sustain that. People talk about singing to the choir like it's a bad thing. The choir needs a lot of singing. It's a thing to the choir. <laughs> because the choir is always singing to someone else. Yeah, the choir needs to get together and put arms around each other and hum. Make sure we're in key. I'd just I like to say, say uh, no, it's, I, I also, I get to experience a lot of love in my life. Um, I get to experience a lot, uh, I get to be connected to my erotic self quite often, and I get to be in that space of being nurtured and held and vulnerable, and all of those things give me hope as well. I'd just like to thank these amazing women. I really would. Mm -hmm.
Tavern and New York Theater Workshop for giving us our Thank you. 